today's program really um, is um, quite special. There aren't uh, many opportunities to do something so historically significant in real time. And um, while we're going to hear Sylvia's story and Grant's as well, I just I really want to encourage you. Uh, uh, the 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 last third of the program, there are some things that have actually happened today in real time that are actually the extension of the story. And um, so we will we will get there. Um, you know, as Ari mentioned, his family is from from Lithuania. And my family is as well. And the, um, the origin of today's event uh, sort of began with us recently talking about uh, some family work that we've done and the things that we've discovered. Um, but any family discoveries uh, about the family uh, that we lost or family that we found um, really... Uh, I would say in some ways pales in comparison with the story that Sylvia discovered in her own journey. Um, in her book, The Nazi's Granddaughter, which once again, I highly recommend, um, is uh, a really beautiful story and a painful one at the same time. Um, Sylvia is not here alone and Grant Goshen, who is a friend and a teacher of, of mine, in just a few moments, will show you how the two of them found one another, um, is also the author of another book called Malice, Murder, and Manipulation. And um, I also recommend this book as well. Um, so, um, Sylvia, um, the title of the book, The Nazi's Granddaughter, I know is sort of um, an overarching uh, theme of the book and, and uh, the major discovery that came through your book. I wanted to say in advance that your life story and, and the, the, um, the, the uh, challenges, opportunities, and the resilience in the book, we're not going to be able to get to everything today. Um, but I hope that with CSP and that we'll be able to invite you back and hear about the other chapters of your story. Um, today's focus is really on sort of what the title of the book is. And maybe um, what, um, what becomes obvious is that this is something you discovered. So maybe you can tell us about um, uh, how did you find out um, about your grandfather's story and um, how that affected your life? Sure, thank you, Charlie. Um, well, I grew up in Chicago in a very Lithuanian community. And um, when I was growing up, it was the Cold War. And my mother and my grandmother uh, often told me stories about my grandfather. I never met my grandfather. He died 14 years before I was born. But the stories they told me uh, were just stories of his heroism. So I only knew that he was a hero. Um, I heard that he died fighting for Lithuania's freedom in a KGB prison. He died in 1947 and he had been fighting for Lithuania's freedom. Uh, he was trying to round up all the partisans to fight against the Soviet Union. And the KGB caught him and then tortured him in the KGB prison. And um, in February, 1947, they shot him in the back of the skull, tossed him in a mass grave, and his remains are still un unidentified today. So all I knew was that he was a martyr who died for Lithuania's freedom. Before that, uh, I was told he was in a Nazi concentration camp, also for two years and tortured. And the story I was told, it was for saving Jews. Uh, before that, he was the governor of Chole during the, during the Nazi occupation. I was told very little about what he did then. Before that, he uh, led the rebellion that we're talking about today, June 22nd, 1941. He, he was a leader in Jamaitia, the Northwestern part of Lithuania. 
And June 22nd, Lithuanians always refer to as the five day uprising against the Soviet Union. And that's the only part of the story I ever heard growing up. And Lithuanians are very, have been very proud about this five day uprising because they fought against the communists and the communists ran like dogs with tails in between their legs. So little Lithuania won against big Soviet Union and got the country back. Um, so that's all I heard. And my mom was gonna write a book about her father. The community in Chicago expected her to write a book about her famous father. Then in the year 2000, she got very sick and she was only 60 years old. And that is when uh, she went to the hospital and um, caught a terrible infection and uh, uh, was on her deathbed. And so she calls me to her deathbed and says, Sylvia, you have to write the book. Of course, it's no question over what book this is. And I was uh, distraught, my mother was dying, but I said, yes. And so that is how I got sort of sucked into the story, if you will. I, this was not my project, this was mom's project. This was not anything I was gonna work on. I, I cheered her on from the sidelines, but this, Pro this project was so important to her, she couldn't let it go even in death. And so she had to pass it on to me. And um, so my mother died February, 2000. And then my grandmother survived her by five months, her, uh, Nore Jonas Noreka's widow. And she calls me now in July, 2000, and now she's dying. She, ha she had a heart attack, like her third or fourth one. And she calls me to her deathbed and says, Sylvia, how's the book going? And I said, don't worry much, it does. It, you know, I, I've got all of mom's material and I'm gonna start working on it. I'm not gonna let it go the way mom did. I, I'm a journalist, I'm young. At that time, I was only 38 years old. I'm gonna get it done. And I thought I was giving her words of comfort. And this is the first hint that I got, but I didn't even know it was a hint yet. And she says, don't write the book. I'm like, what do you mean, Wachita, don't write the, of course I'm going to write the book. Mom asked me to write it. You know, I promised her. And she didn't like my answer. So she rolled over in bed and faced the wall. She was tired. And that was the end of the conversation. And um, so they both wanted to be buried in Lithuania. And so now it's October 2000. And we, my brother and I buried them in Lithuania. And then... Um, we visited the school named after my grandfather. He has a grammar school named after him, the Jonas Noreka Grammar School in Shukone. And he's got some streets named after him. He's got some plaques on buildings. So he's considered, uh, he's not a high level top tier hero. He's kind of a mid-level hero, if you will. And um, so we, were, we visited the school named after him. The children had flowers, singing songs. We were greeted very grandly. And uh, the director pulls me uh, aside and he says, thank you so much for writing this book about your grandfather. I heard you took over the project from your mother. It's so important we have uh, Lithuanian heroes and we honor them and our country really needs heroes. And I said, thank you. And, and then I said, you know, as long as I'm here, why don't you tell me the story of how you named the school after my grandfather? I, ha I had never heard it. And he said, well, before we had this horrible Russian name, uh, because Lithuania was occupied by the Soviet Union until 1990. And as soon as Lithuania got its independence, we wanted a good patriotic Lithuanian name. And so um, your grandfather was born in this town and it was a natural. Um, so I said, okay, that makes a lot of sense. But then he says, uh, you know, to kind of to the side, he pulls me to the side and he says, but you know, I got a lot of grief over naming the school after your grandfather. And I said, grief from whom? And he says, grief from the Jews. And I said, what could the Jews possibly say about my wonderful heroic grandfather? And he looked at me like I should have known this. And, I, and he says, he was accused of killing Jews. Um, so that was the first time I ever heard this in my entire life. I was 38 years old. Um, 
at that point, I did not even know about the Holocaust in Lithuania. And uh, so when I heard this, I thought I was going to faint. Uh, you know, uh, it was it was it was a punch to the gut, and I just I had to sit down, you know, and um, and so now he's noticing I'm visibly upset, and he says. Uh, don't worry, it's all in the past. You know, it's not true. It's just communist propaganda. So anyway, once you hear something, you can't unhear it. And I uh, came back to Chicago and I talked to my father and some other people. And I said, have you heard the story about Jonas Noreka uh, being accused of killing Jews? And, th and they had all heard this. Everybody from my father's generation had all heard this. And um, so I did not, I did not understand this. And it's not true. It's just communist propaganda. Um, Grant, I think you're back. If you are. I'm back and Sylvia is going to come and join me right here. Okay. Um, somehow our internet connection is unstable. So we'll just share the same computer screen. So while she's getting a chair, let me continue. Let, let, let me take it from a slightly different angle. Okay, Please. Rabbi? Uh, um, it's all good, yeah. Okay. So in 2010, I was in my grandfather's shtetl in Lithuania. And I was going from death pit to death pit, um, lighting Yotzad candles and saying the Kaddish. And I was with an academic. And I said to the academic, who did the actual murders? And without batting an eyelid, without batting an eyelid, the academic looked at me and said, it was Jonas Noreka. And so not knowing who Jonas Noreka was, I came back to the United States and I started researching. And Jonas Noreka was outed in 1980. Grant, it was, uh, we actually lost you there for a moment. So go back to the academic telling you who was it, who was responsible for the murder of your family. Okay. The, the, the academic instantly, with, with, without having to think, said the murderer was a man by the name of Jonas Noreka. I didn't know who Jonas Noreka was. So I came back to the United States and started researching. In 1984, the Spiegel magazine in Germany outed Jonas Noreka as the murderer of the Jews in the region that my family was from. Uh, six years after he was identified as the murderer, Lithuania regained independence. And seven years later, they named him as a major national hero. So, that was 13 years after he was identified as the apex perpetrator in that area. Um, I started approaching the Lithuanian government and saying, obviously you've made a mistake over here. You can't be honoring the murderer of thousands of Lithuanian citizens as a national. And I was rebuffed over and over and over again. Um, in 2015, the mayor of the capital city took down some artistic Soviet statues. They weren't even of anybody in particular. They were just representational of the Soviet era. And he spoke about his. I think it's important to recognize that as Sylvie is going on her journey in terms of um, discovering the background of her family, right, and her grandfather, that Grant's on a similar journey himself. Um, and the uh, for me in the book, um, what was really most amazing was when um, uh, um, Sylvia writes about an email that she sent to Grant. 
Um, and this email uh, reads, Dear Mr. Grant Goshen, I believe you know who I am, the granddaughter of Jonas Nareka. After new, nearly two decades of research, I've come to the same conclusion as you have about my grandfather. For me, this is heartbreaking, but I am finally ready to begin speaking about this more publicly. As you know, Andreas Kolikokas has been in touch with me and ever since I've been thinking about our strange connection. I have promised to write him a letter about my findings. In the meantime, I was hoping that we could begin to talk to each other, perhaps initially by phone and perhaps eventually in person. Um, if uh, I don't know, in, a, in just a moment, we'll hear from Grant what it would be like um, to receive such a note. Um, but some of you have asked, why are the two of them sitting together in one space? And um, that's a, that, that is a, uh, a question we'll be able to answer. So, um, so let me ask you first, though, and I'll find your phone in one second, Grant. What was it like to receive this email? It was absolutely shocking. Um, I sat at my desk. Okay, is this better? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. The reason Sylvia is here with me is I just put in the chat box. We held this event over the weekend, which will, which if everybody watches afterwards, will give you an idea of what it was about. So I received that email from Sylvia and it was shocking. I mean, here was the granddaughter. I knew who she was. Um, here was the granddaughter of the man that murdered approximately 100 of my relatives making contact with me. Um, I was deeply suspicious. I, I didn't know what she wanted. I had encountered only lies, fraud, and deceit from the government of Lithuania for decades. So when the granddaughter of the murderer contacted me, I, I was absolutely shocked. Rabbi, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean, okay. uh, we're all able to hear you. So I, I said to her that I needed some time. I needed to gather my thoughts. I needed to, to calm down and that I would talk to her later. And then Sylvia called me at the prearranged time. And she said to me, I've read your research. So I said, yes. And she said, and you've made a huge error. So I said to her, what? She says, you've missed approximately 10,000 of my grandfather's victims. And with that, all suspicion dissipated. Um, Sylvia and I have been working together to expose the Holocaust denial and revision by the Lithuanian government. Um, we've shown that Sylvia's grandfather is only one of the perpetrators Lithuania has rewritten into national hero status. Um, the government of Lithuania actually has an entire government department just dedicated to Holocaust fraud. They, they, they employ over 100 people. It is the biggest museum in Lithuania. And their task is to convert murderers into heroes, shift blame from Lithuania to Nazis, um, deny the facts, act as lawyers for the murderers and to whitewash history. Um, and Sylvia and I together, uh, working together because we've, we've become a team. The, the granddaughter of the perpetrator and the grandson of victims, uh, Sylvia and I have become a team to expose the Holocaust fraud by the government and we've done so. Well, let me go back a step, and if uh, if you can uh, if you can hand the phone to Sylvia, maybe you can um, 
let's just go back one step and talk about um, that process for you and sort of from that point of, of hearing rumors to the point where you came to your conclusions, maybe you can walk us through that. It was a very, very long process. Um, when I, from the, the moment I first heard the rumor, I essentially went into denial over it. All Lithuanians in Chicago were in denial over it. So I was Lithuanian. That's what I did too. But um, as time went, and I was working on this very slowly. Uh, I was a mother, young children. I was a journalist. Uh, this was completely just a side project. Nobody really knew I was working on this. Just very, just a handful of people. Um, so I was taking my time with this uh, for a lot of reasons. But one reason was psychologically, I just, I didn't know how to process this. And so I just, you know, was in denial for a long time. Eventually, I, and this is years uh, because I was a journalist, I thought, okay, I finally got to the point where I can't just completely ignore this rumor. I'm going to have to address it somehow. So once I uh, decide to address it, maybe I can exonerate him. I'm going to prove my grandfather's innocence. So yeah. as twisted as all that is, it at least got me to at least look at that era and uh, once I did started looking, the journalist sort of in me really kicked in and I started noticing things that were very obvious uh, to, you know, um, Jews, I suppose. But, you know, uh, as a Lithuanian, to me, it, it was very troubling. So one thing that I noticed in the Lithuanian side of things is that there's very, very little written about the Nazi occupation. There's just almost nothing. And there's a lot written about that, this five day uprising. There's a lot, a lot of written about that. And there's a lot written um, when the Soviets come in again in 1944, 45. And uh, there's a lot written over the Soviet occupation. But that three year period of the Nazi occupation is like a big mystery to Lithuanians. And um, so then I had to go into the Jewish press and Jewish publications and Jewish sources and I uh, very slowly started seeing things, you know, that's when I started to learn about the Holocaust in Lithuania. That's when I first learned that Lithuania had a 95% murder rate of Jews, which is the highest rate in all of Europe. That was completely new to me. So, um, so I started educating myself about the Holocaust in Lithuania. I knew about it in Germany. You know, I'd heard about it in us. I read it in Frank. Uh, but I did not know about it at all. All I heard about was Lithuanians being sent to Siberia by the Soviets. <laughs> so, so um, then, then a couple, a, a couple of other documents started uh, appeared. I guess uh, I found a document that my grandfather wrote. It was a brochure that he wrote called Pakal Galva Lietuvi, which means "Raise Your Head, Lithuanian," and it's a 32-page bro brochure that he wrote at the age of uh, 22 in 1933. And it essentially is asking all Lithuanians to boycott everything that the Jews are producing in Lithuania. And at that time, Jews uh, owned a lot of the businesses. They had a lot of good positions. Um, and this was causing uh, resentment uh, among Lithuanians. And so out of envy, jealousy, uh, the Green Monster, they, uh, my grandfather essentially called for 32 pages of, of um, boycotting everything that the Jews provide and instead buy from Lithuanians. So after 32 pages of this, I was very upset about it. And uh, I put this down and I somehow convinced myself, well, it's bad. It's not good. But at the time, though, there's a lot of anti-Semitism uh, and, um, and uh, you know, I thought he at least wasn't calling for the killing of Jews. So what he did is still a far, a far leap from killing Jews. So, but then, you know, I, I started digging more 
And I found uh, a document that my grandfather signed in uh, 1942, August 22nd, 1940, 1941, August 22nd, 1941. And he called for the creation of a new ghetto in Jagadim. And he called for the rounding up of all Jews and half Jews in the Sholei region of which he was the governor. And so essentially about 2000 Jews were rounded up and brought to Jagare within one week. He said this all had to be done with one, within one week. And, um, and then he can't, you know, had kind of a list of, you know, what the Jews could bring and, um, you know, all, all kinds of little things like that. And so it didn't take me long to find out what happened to all these Jews in Jagade. Within six weeks, they were all murdered on Yom Kippur, uh, early October. I can't remember the exact date. So that was the document that uh, really flipped the switch for me and really made me sort of jump to the other side and uh, really begin looking at my grandfather now as a perpetrator. And then from there, once I made that decision, things started to move much more quickly. And I started to find a lot more things. Um, and I was writing my story finally. And so um, in that whole process, uh, I think I went through every emotion imagine, imaginable. Uh, you know, I, I went through a period of depression. I was despondent. Um, it, it really felt like the end of the, the end of the world to me because it was the end of my Lithuanian identity. And uh, whereas I had until then felt very proud to be a Lithuanian, I was now experiencing shame and embarrassment. And I was by myself kind of going through all this because I knew enough not to let other Lithuanians know about what I'm finding. And um, so it, you know, there's a lot that happened, which, which in the short program, I can't really cover, but right. when I finally met Grant, ironically enough, when we finally connected and finally got to know each other and realized we're on the same side, um, we joined forces. And that is the first time I did not feel alone in the story that I was just not carrying this whole thing on my own shoulders. So listen, I, I can't thank you enough for writing your book, and I can't thank you enough for um, for the work that you did. And I, and and again, I, I really encourage everyone to read the book because um, the way that you navigated so many things in your life and the resistance to writing this book, there was almost natural uh, entropy, you know, sort of holding you back. The fact that you um, completed this book as a, really a Herculean feat, and we're all grateful for it. Let me ask you a question. You wrote a book that, you know, exposed the truth about a national hero and uh, exposed the truth about a, uh, at the same time, a perpetrator of, you know, the Nazis in uh, the Holocaust. What was the reaction to the book um, in Lithuania, and what's been the reaction to the book um, in your own community? Uh, very disappointing to me personally. Um, they're still all in denial over it. But, um, uh, in my in Chicago, it's it's essentially just the cold shoulder. You know, I'm hearing that they don't even want to read it. It's just uh, you know they think I'm a KGB agent. Uh, and so generally the, the, uh, community is against it. And in Lithuania, generally they're mostly against it. I guess the ray of hope I'm having is that I am having some people send me quietly, privately, uh, encouraging notes and telling me that, uh, that they have read the book, that their mind is blown, that they're completely looking at the Holocaust in a different way. And then, uh, but they don't want to go public. <laughs> so um, I'm thinking that it's going to take a while. It's going to take one person at a time uh, to really come to terms with this. Um, yeah. So, so that's, 
That's the reaction. May, may I? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're holding the brand. Okay. So let me, let me, um, let me talk about your partnership. And I'm, I'm just going to build on this for one second, because Sylvia, what you've, um, what you've done quietly with um, grace and patience, um, uh, I wouldn't say is the opposite. I don't mean it that way at all. I mean, Grant has been fighting the good fight, a public good fight against really one man against the Lithuanian, uh, the Lithuanian government in the newspapers, through blogs, in a variety of different ways. Both of you have like uncovered, have revealed the truth about the fate of Lithuanian Jewry. So shouldn't, shouldn't Lithuania, shouldn't we, I mean, there's, by the way, this is one of those unique Zoom sessions where the numbers go up as the hour goes on. That doesn't happen every day. People are here because we're interested. <laughs> we're grateful, right? We're grateful that you've exposed the truth. What's the problem? Okay, so so let let, let me let me give a partial answer by adding two more links. The first link I just added is a Lithuanian government website. It's in Lithuanian. I ask everybody just to save the link, put it through a translator later. In that link, the government of Lithuania threatened me with criminal and constitutional charges for identifying Holocaust perpetrators. The reason Sylvia's book has not taken off in Lithuania, the reason Lithuanians won't read it, is because the information has been suppressed and people are intimidated. Lithuania is currently having a, a war of words with Belarus and they keep accusing the Belarusian government of suppressing information and intimidating those that speak out. But if you look at that website, you'll see that the what the government of Lithuania does is exactly the same as what Belarus does. I'm going to add another link now. This is my litigation against the government of Lithuania. Not for a single penny, not for one single penny. The only thing I've asked for in almost 20 legal actions is for them to tell the truth about some of the perpetrators. Now, what the government of Lithuania has done as regards Sylvia's grandfather, is one of many. They have consciously, deliberately rewritten history to convert murderers into heroes and to enforce that with the full rule of law. I've had to take my case in, in front of the European Court of Human Rights because we cannot find an independent, impartial, judge in Lithuania to actually look at the facts of the case. The courts have ruled unanimously on technicalities, um, such as standing. I, I wasn't personally killed. Therefore, I don't have the right to complain about their disinformation. Um, the, you know, the Noreka secretary, gave testimony uh, that Noreka said to him, I've given the orders to murder the Jews. The government of Lithuania said that he's unreliable, so they're not going to consider it. Um, Sylvia supported one of my lawsuits. They said Sylvia was unreliable because she disagreed with her mother. The any incriminating evidence, they simply say is unreliable and they won't consider it. So unfortunately, I've had to take my case in front of the European Court of Human Rights in, in, in the hopes that Eastern European judges will not be the ones assigned to the case and that we will get an independent, intelligent, impartial judge to actually look at how egregiously Lithuania rewrites history. So let's, um, if this wasn't 
hurtful enough and painful enough. Um, earlier, Grant shared something. Um, Grant uh, shared something earlier with Ari and myself um, about a plaque that was erected today. And friends, it's it not. It, what, what's that again? I, 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 don't, I don't believe it's actually been erected oh. yet. But I it was think announced it's about today. To but it, but it so, was announced so, today. And by the way, as we were, as we remember, today is the 80th anniversary. This is this is a historically known fact. Today is the 80th anniversary of Operation Barbarossa. As soon as the Nazis crossed into Soviet Soviet territory, the basically the death certificates of millions of Jews were signed on the spot. Their deaths may have been delayed, but as soon as they crossed that border, the uh, the Nazis. This was not an act. This was not an um, wasn't like an act an accident. These weren't civilians who were killed. Along with the Nazi army, the German army at that time were Einsatzgruppen, mobile killing squads. So on the 80th anniversary of the Nazis going into Soviet territory where the Holocaust by bullets began, Grant, what happened? Okay, so the leader of the Lithuanians at that time was a man by the name of Kazis Skirpa. Skirpa called for the elimination of Jews. Um, this was well before the Shoah. Skirpa then went to Berlin to act as the ambassador to the Nazi regime. He continued to tell the Nazis how Jews should be eliminated. Um, at the evacuation of Soviet troops, the Lithuanians had their so-called uprising. Their uprising comprised mostly of shooting Soviet troops in the back. And before Lithuanian, before Nazis actually arrived in Lithuania, Lithuanians began murdering the Jews. By the end, by the end of 1941, by the end of 1941, 80% of the Jews in Lithuania had been murdered. The first mass murders of the Shoah were in Lithuania. Lithuania showed Germany how it could be done. And only on January 20th, 1942, after the Lithuanian genocide of the Jews had largely been completed, did the Nazis vote on implementing uh, the final solution. Now, the Lithuanian government says that Skirpa's calling for the elimination of Jews meant the evacuation. Um, because the rabbi is a rabbi, I won't use the words I'd like to use. Um, suffice to say, that is a lie. They've said he never meant ill will towards the Jew, Jews. Calling for the elimination of Jews, according to the government of Lithuania, was an incident of anti-Semitism, but that didn't mean that he actually meant to kill, kill anybody. Under any, under any definition, Kazis Kirpa is a major primary apex predator and a Holocaust perpetrator. Just as we have been going after Jonas Noreka to get his honors revoked, we've been addressing Kazis Kirpa. The government of Lithuania doubles down on their fraud every time. Every time we expose another dishonesty, they double down again. So today, today is the 80th anniversary of the start of the slaughter of the Jews of Lithuania. And in response, Today, this announcement was made. Rabbi, do you want to put that back on the screen?
Lithuania is going to put a new monument to honor the man that called for the elimination of Jews, that proposed the Holocaust in Lithuania, and they're going to and they're going to put that monument on the outside of their genocide museum. Their genocide museum honors perpetrators of the only genocide that took place on Lithuanian territory. To show us Jews how much they care about the Holocaust on the 80th anniversary of them starting to murder our people, they are going to honor the very leader that proposed the, 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 the Holocaust. So this is something for internal consumption. You can see at the top of this post how it was actually in Lithuanian. To the outside world, their Ministry of Foreign Affairs tells Jews how sad they are about the Holocaust, what a loss it was. They always use the word lost as if we're going to go into the forest and find them again. They never use the word slaughter or murder or, or, or shoah. They, they always say the Jews were lost. Um, so internally in Lithuania, they honor the murderers. Externally in the West, they say how much they regret the loss. Um, the Lithuanian government has been caught defrauding U.S. congressional documents on another perpetrator by the name of Brazitis. Uh, Congress has since gotten involved to tell the government of Lithuania that they may not use congressional documents for Holocaust fraud. Um, the Lithuanian government is fully engaged in Holocaust revisionism. They do it blatantly. Um, and at this point in time, there's very few people standing up against it. I mean, you, you, on, on one screen, you're seeing the two people that are the primary fighters against Holocaust revisionism in Lithuania. So let's, um, let's, let's build on that idea. What, um, what can we, the people who are here today and, uh, the supporters of CSP, um, and quite frankly, just the rest of humanity, what can we do to help your cause of bringing the truth to light in Lithuania? You see that, that uh, third last uh, link that I put up of my legal actions, I mean, the, the last one, the third last link on there, there's a combined document um, of a letter written by Congressman Sherman to the Prime Minister of Lithuania. The final link of that page is his follow-up document. Um, you could each print that out and attach it to a cover letter and write to your own member of Congress and say a foreign government cannot use congressional documents for Holocaust fraud. You can see it, it says over there, the combined document is here. Okay, do you see that? On, on 11, 2020, on 11, just two up on 11, 2020, at the very end, it says the combined document is here. Yes, print that link out. The, 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 the here is a highlight and we'll take you to a document. Print that document out. Correct, that's right. It'll, it should download on your screen. That, that, that uh, yes, there's a few pages on that. Um, okay. Um, there, you'll, if you go further up, you'll see the letter from Congress. Okay, more, 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 more. Um, if you would then write to your own member of Congress and attach a copy of this and say, please advise the government of Lithuania not to use US congressional documents for purposes of Holocaust fraud 
It will bring this to the attention of more members of Congress. Um, it's the single it's it's the single best thing I can ask you to do. Um, you know, un until Lithuania is held to account, they will continue to do it. To after having been so exposed, if, if you look up my name or Sylvia's name um, in the news, you'll see how much press there's been. To after all of this press go to go out again and to put up a new monument for an even bigger perpetrator than Sylvia's grandfather shows how little they care about being publicly exposed. The only thing that will stop Lithuania from doing this is if the US government makes them stop. And so, it is um, only us on the Zoom today that can make them do that. So we've received a bunch of questions and I uh, want to honor the, uh, the time. Um, um, one question is uh, for you, uh, is uh, for you, Sylvia. Um, number one is, um, uh, what was response of your family to writing the book? Um, that's question number one. I'm, then I have a follow up for you. Um, my brother has been extremely supportive, so I got a lot of support from him, but my father, not so much. Uh, he wishes I didn't write the book. Uh, his new wife says I, you know, it makes Lithuania look bad. Um, my father at least read the book. So he's kind of now on the fence. Like maybe I came across something. <laughs> Um, well, let me ask you, um, so, yeah. But my uncles, his brothers have not read the book, you know, so um, th that's kind of the little swing in response. Right. Um, what, I mean, listen, I think we all gained a lot by you writing the book. What did you lose by writing this book? I don't know. I, I lost uh, the pride I used to have at being Lithuanian. So, and to me, that was a great loss. I lost my uh, Lithuanian identity. And um, that, that is a big loss. What's, I mean, uh, for you, um, what's your next um, is there an, a next uh, phase for you um, after writing the book? Like, what do you think for you comes next in all this? Well, the, during this year now, I'm just trying to get the word out. Uh, you know, the hardest, the hard, for me, it was very, very difficult to get the book out on, on many levels. But now I'm trying to get, uh, the information out about the book so that people would read the book. So Grant and I have teamed up um, to promote the book and uh, to try to get as much publicity as we can about the book, because like Grant said, unfortunately, and I knew this all along, this is why I've been working so hard to get a wonderful publisher and, you know, to, to get the book as big as it is. Lithuania itself is not going to do anything about this. They will only do it from the outside in. So it's very important that um, if anything's going to be done about this, for Lithuania to acknowledge their own role in the Holocaust, I still believe it's going to have to be from the outside in. At some point, Lithuania is going to just be forced to kind of realize what happened. I, I do wish it would be more organic and that um, they would just take ownership themselves. Um, I do think it's important for them, you know, it's traumatic to, to, to admit to this, but once they get past it, I think it could be very healing for them too. So my hope is that they finally admit it on a big, on a big genuine heartfelt scale 
I'm not sure what that looks like yet, but that's my goal. Yeah. Rabbi, Rabbi, yeah, please grant. Somebody just, asked, somebody just asked for some names of, of some of the other perpetrators that we've identified. I just put up 11 names over there. The first name, I, I, I just want to display to you how egregious this is. The first name on there is Baltusis. Baltusis was the leader of the concentration camp guards at Majdanek. Now, if anybody's been to Majdanek, it was an open camp. The citizens of Lublin saw what was going on. The government of Lithuania said he served on the outside of the camp. Therefore, he didn't know what was happening on the inside of the camp. Therefore, he's innocent of any crimes. I mean, to, to, to come up with that level of deception, you've got to be... It's just pure evil. And this is the official position of today's Lithuanian government. They have never been through a denazification process. Um, their marketing is to the outside world. And what they say to the outside world and what they say to their own citizenry inside Lithuania are completely different. So what we can do, I think... Uh friends uh is we can make sure that um the truth reaches our leadership our uh, political leadership our spiritual leadership um and that uh 80 years later the world demands the world um deserves to hear the truth right um that's uh, ultimately i think Grant, I, if I remember from another conversation we had, that you guys have a fund together to get uh, Sylvia's book in the hand of every member of the U.S. Congress, right? Correct. I'll give you that link now. Um, okay, this might have been the invitation, but I'll, I'll send this to you now. Um, right. Somebody asked about. We'll make the sure also that that goes out in the follow-up information. Okay, I think that's it. Um, I'm just doing it on the fly while we're struggling with with communication. Somebody yeah. asked about the wife of the previous ambassador. They represent themselves as great friends of the Jews, lovers of Israel, lovers of everything Jewish. Um, but if you ask them about the murderers they too will tell you no Lithuanian saw anything, no Lithuanian heard anything, no Lithuanian knew anything. It's all everybody else's fault, but every Lithuanian was trying to save a dozen Jews. Um, Rabbi, if you, every Lithuanian virtually I've ever met has told me their family saved a dozen Jews. If you added that dozen Jews together that every family saved, of the 220,000 Jews murdered in Lithuania, millions of them would have been saved. Um, there was an article, the president of Germany made a statement last week that there is hardly a single family in Germany that doesn't have a perpetrator in the family. The opposite sentiment exists in Lithuania where every family will tell you they were saving Jews. The, the, the previous Lithuanian ambassador to Germany is a man by the name of Samaska. His grandfather was a major perpetrator. The Samaska family wrote, wrote a book to say how he was saving Jews. Uh, Sylvia's grandfather murdered somewhere around 15,000 Jews, estimated. The Lithuanian government wrote a formal finding that is a finding in law enforced by the state that he was secretly saving Jews. If the government of Lithuania is speaking about the Holocaust, if an ambassador of Lithuania is speaking about the Holocaust, please make the assumption that they are lying. Well, um, I could say uh, in many ways that's the appropriate note for us to conclude on, right? This is not just about memory. 
right? Memory is not, um, memory at this moment would be too easy. It's really a fight for the truth and really, and maybe to honor the memory of the millions of Jews or, or you know, uh, the 6 million Jews who were killed. And uh, those of us who uh, lost family in Lithuania, um, the best way to honor their memory is to bring truth um, to light. Um, I want to, uh, I want to thank you uh, for a really a, uh, a moving presentation uh, this afternoon, this evening. Um, and I, uh, I know that this is um, our being together, our remembering and our uh, discussing um, what we can do um, will help in a small way to bring this truth uh, to light and to honor the memory of those who were killed. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here. Please be on the lookout for a recording of the session and a bunch of links that we hope that you will share with other people. This was an amazing uh, discussion and presentation, and we're grateful for it. And the one thing we'd ask for you is to um, share it with somebody else. So thank you all for being here, and we look forward to seeing you all real soon. Thank you, Grant. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you. Bye-bye.